Thanks a lot, Nishoka-san, for the invitation. Also, big thanks to Mechi, Jogmek, and Aita for hosting this super relevant uh, event. And I'm going to talk about the prospects for CCUS. I think the U is missing there in, in carb markets uh, more broadly. My presentation will, I think, repeat some of the things that were already mentioned yesterday and, and some today and uh, give a bit of an outlook uh, about the relevance of carbon markets for financing uh, CCS uh, projects. Um, before I get to that, just uh, one slide about uh, South Pole, our company. So um, South Pole enables corporates, capital markets, and the public sector to reduce their impacts on climate change through advisory services and high impact carbon offset projects. In over 15 years of history, uh, South Pole has developed more than 1,000 projects that have reduced, avoided, or sequestered uh, more than 60 million tons of, of CO2. Um, and as part of our advisory business, uh, we advise more than 1,000 clients, typically very large multinational uh, companies, Fortune 500 companies, on their climate strategy and respective implementation. So South Pole is involved both, I think, on the client side and in shaping climate strategies and helping companies to figure out how to invest in projects. Uh, we offer clients a whole range of different um, approaches to, to um, procure carbon credits uh, and finance uh, the, the projects, uh, which you see on, on the bottom left of the slide. Um, South Pole by now um, is one of the leading market players, one of the biggest companies specialized only on climate change. We have around 1,200 employees and more than 30 uh, offices. And our experts um, include uh, consultants, scientists, project developers, investors, um, uh, and, and, and so on. So this is just a quick, quick overview uh, about South Pole. Before I get into the topic of CCS and carb markets, just wanted to repeat again the, the big picture uh, in, in terms of what are the big drivers that are driving uh, CCUS implementation. I think you are all familiar with uh, these curves. So this represents um, the in green, the, the drastic Carbon decarbonization pathway that we need to follow according to IPCC in order to reach net zero emissions uh, around 2050 and stick to the 1.5 degree goal as defined in the Paris Agreement. So if we compare the target of the IPCC in green to the current uh, level of ambition of policies uh, and action that are uh, in place today, there is a, a huge gap. And even if we take all the pledges of the Paris Agreement, which you have, we have to remind ourselves, those pledges are still voluntary commitments. Uh, they're not binding. They still have to be translated into mandatory laws uh, in all countries. But even if we look at the Paris pledges, uh, there is still a, a, a big gap uh, and we would be on track to 2.1 degrees um, according to the current pledges and, and the Paris Agreement. So there is a huge gap and that gap means um, that um, going forward, CCOS will play um, an, 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 a more and more important role in the decarbonization strategies of countries. So we will see more and more CCUS policies and regulations coming up in several uh, countries. And there will be also more and more uh, CCUS financial incentives as a result of that. This graph is by, provided by the International Energy Agency and highlights the role of CCUS technologies in achieving uh, the necessary emission reductions uh, for the net zero uh, scenario. Uh, and as you can see, uh, CCUS uh, potential estimated by IEA or the contribution uh, is in the range of eight gigatons out of um, 35 odd um, uh, gigatons. So, it's between a quarter to um, a fifth of the overall contribution to decarbonization should come from CCUS, according to the International Energy Agency, which is obviously 
uh, very significant. But what you also see in this curve is that um, the, the deployment of CCUS is expected later in comparison to other um, uh, other solutions. So, so the, 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 the surface, the purple surface of CCUS starts to uh, increase in size only after a certain time. And that's because um, the, of the complexity of CCUS projects and necessary investments in things like uh, transport, CO2 transport infrastructure, for, uh, like CO2 pipelines, uh, which will take some time uh, to emerge. Uh, and I think one fundamental thing that I think everybody needs to understand before we talk about the potential um, of, of uh, carb markets to help CCUS uh, technologies is this distinction between CCUS versus CDR. CDR stands for carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and in essence, we're talking here about this distinction between CO2 reductions versus CO2 removals. And this comes actually from the uh, IPCC report from 2018 and has been taken up by the Science-Based Targets Initiative as the blueprint for, let's say, credible, a credible climate strategy. And even though the Science-Based Target Initiative applies mainly to companies, uh, the same logic can be applied, uh, applied also to countries or on a national level. So uh, what the Science-Based Targets Initiative tells us uh, in terms of um, what a credible climate strategy is, uh, is basically a steep decarbonization pathway that is in line with science. So bringing down the emissions with an average of, I would say, between 5 and 6% uh, per year um, to, to, to get that, that, those blue, dark blue bars down over time significantly. And that should be based on near-term targets, so over the next five to 10 years, as well as the long-term net zero target, which typically stretches to 2050. Uh, in addition to the, uh, those reductions, the SPTI also recommends that companies invest in um, compensation projects uh, that could, can be also outside the value chain of a company. So this would be the traditional carbon offsets that we see in voluntary markets. This would be point number three and, and the green surface here uh, on, on, this, uh, on, on this slide. Um, and, and here there is a potential actually for some of that money to support uh, CCS or CCU projects um, in voluntary or compliance markets. And then maybe the, the most important thing that came out is fairly recent, since only since 2018, this is a big trend in, in the market, is the light blue bars. These are the required negative emissions in order to achieve net zero. So um, because we are so far out already with, with the emissions according to science, it's not enough anymore to only reduce emissions. We also have to take now emissions out of the atmosphere. This is what we call negative emissions or carbon removals. And this is now, for every company that wants to achieve net zero, or every country will need uh, these negative emissions. Um, and, and they um, have specific characteristics that we need to understand. Um, so, and, and I think, and this slide outlines how to distinguish, uh, in the case of CCUS and CDR technologies, between uh, emission reductions in, in, that are circled in, uh, in yellow and the, the carbon removals, which are circled in, in blue here on, on, on this graph. So this graph uh, distinguishes between different CO2 sources uh, and different applications, CCS and two types of CCO solutions. So starting on the left, the, the first column, um, there we have um, fossil fuel CO2, then in the middle, the biogenic CO2 or CO2 from the atmosphere. So these are three different CO2 sources. And if we do a carbon capture and storage project uh, with uh, um, a fossil fuel based or so CO2 that comes from fossil fuel combustion, and we store that permanently, um, that uh, will only lead to an emission reduction. 
If we use biogenic CO2 and have permanent storage, that creates a removal. That's because uh, biomass is seen as a, like a temporary short-term storage for atmospheric CO2. And uh, if, uh, you, um, um, if you capture CO2 from the atmosphere and store it permanently uh, with direct air capture, for example, that also qualifies as a, re as a removal. In the middle here, we have uh, the case of permanent storage of CO2 uh, in, uh, in, in, in CO2 uh, in minerals, so cement, for example, uh, and other uh, durable products. So this would not apply to plastics uh, and, and, and CCU cases that would deliver short-term, uh, short-lived products. Um, so here um, we uh, have also the case of fossil uh, CO2 from fossil fuel origin stored in concrete for example uh, for a long time uh, that but that would qualify only as a, as a, as a as an emission reduction in the middle you see uh, biogenic CO2 and in the bottom atmospheric CO2 being stored in in, in uh, durable materials that could qualify as a removal and on the far right uh, a power to X applications when we use CO2 um, for the production of synthetic fuels, for example, if the, the source of the CO2 is uh, from fossil fuels, it, uh, it's neither an emission reduction nor a removal, it, it creates more uh, additional emissions. Um, and the other two cases where we would use biogenic or atmospheric CO2 uh, for the production of synthetic fuels, that can only help to reduce emissions if the life cycle assessment of um, this case is better than conventional uh, fossil fuels. Um, so it's, it's a bit complex. Um, however, it's very important to understand the distinction between projects and emission sources that would qualify for removals versus emission reductions, because there is a significant price difference in the market for these two project types. And uh, this is summarized again here uh, in this slide. So if you look at the typical business as usual uh, emission trajectory of, of a company or a country, which is the, the top uh, yellow line, when we want to bring that curve down through decarbonization measures, uh, there, I think we talk, we're, we're using the term CCUS. Um, and when we talk about negative emissions that can generate carbon removals, uh, we are using the term uh, CDR or carbon dioxide uh, removals. And both are very important, uh, and, and, but both I think will address different segments of the markets and potentially different policies uh, as well. The other important thing to distinguish be before I get into my predictions about the role of car markets and CCS is just the distinction between voluntary and compliance uh, markets. This is very high level and there were, I think, presentations and slides before that went into more detail. But on a high level, voluntary carbon markets uh, is basically the, the market driven by the private sector and individuals that are buying carbon credits on a voluntary basis. So this represents today uh, around 300 million uh, tons uh, of uh, credits uh, in the market. And if we look at the, the compliance carbon markets, which are typically established by governments and can take many different shapes and forms, it can be an emission trading scheme, it can be a baseline and crediting scheme, like um, most of the things we have been discussing in this event, Sometimes it can also come, uh, come in the form of, of a carbon tax. Uh, these uh, markets are much bigger in size. So they represent 11.86 uh, billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So much, much bigger than voluntary carbon markets. And the best overview of these compliance carbon markets is provided by the World Bank with their carbon pricing dashboard. And here uh, you see just an overview of all the countries in the world that are currently implementing uh, these um, compliance schemes. So by now we have uh, 70 uh, carbon pricing initiatives implemented in more than 47 countries, covering almost one quarter of global emissions. 
which is already quite significant and growing. Uh, the complexity here is that every country has its own uh, regulations and legislation, so it's a very fragmented uh, space, uh, to, which makes it difficult for multinational companies to be on top of all the developments in all the jurisdictions. Uh, the voluntary carbon markets um, have been growing at a significant uh, pace uh, in the last few years. So uh, they have reached close to $2 billion um, uh, last year. However, that's still small, right? Um, I think in comparison to, I always like to this comparison, the, dog, the global market for dog food is $35 billion. Um, so the co voluntary car markets are still relatively small uh, in, in comparison. And if we think about this, the, need, the investment needs in CCS, um, yeah, we, it, it doesn't go th that far. However, the market is expected to grow significantly over time. And on the right side, you see projections from different sources about the growth of the market in uh, up to 2030 and 2050. So depending on the scenario you take, we may see uh, up to uh, 15 times increase in volumes uh, by 2030. And looking into 2050, the market, if we look at the most optimistic prediction, could even grow 100 times uh, in comparison to today. So at current prices, we would be talking about a market of $200 billion uh, per year by 2050. Uh, the other important thing to understand about voluntary carbon markets is that the prices vary significantly across project types. So. Um, uh, industry, uh, projects links to industry and the power sector typically sell at a very low price, so two to three um, dollars per ton. Whereas nature based uh, projects and community based projects, which have higher co benefits, sell at the premium between five to eight dollars uh, per ton. That was, it was, these were the numbers for 2021. However, there are transactions in the market that, um, that are uh, coming close even to um, $800 or $1,000 a ton for technological removals, for example. So there is a, a vast range of, of prices uh, depending on, 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 the, on the project type. And now I come to the final slides of the presentation and uh, my little crystal ball session to uh, tell you a little bit uh, what, in my personal opinion, uh, carbon markets could contribute to uh, CCUS technologies. So my hypothesis number one is that voluntary markets will play a marginal role for CCS with a focus on emission reductions. For example, uh, CCS uh, to uh, reduce emissions on power generation, oil and gas industry, cement, steel, or chemical industry. The reason for this is that the voluntary market is simply not big enough the CCUS industry requires 130 billion US dollars per year of investments from now until 2050. Whereas the voluntary carbon market is still at the range of $2 billion per year um, as of last year. And it might grow to 100 or maybe even half a billion dollars, but that still is not sufficient, considering also that the voluntary market has that preference for uh, nature based solutions, for example. Another important thing is that the prices and willingness to, play, to pay for, uh, by tradi uh, for, for traditional CCS projects in these industries is not likely to reach the required levels for CCS projects over the next 10 years. I think this was also highlighted by Mat in Matthias' presentation. Um, so I think th there's still a big gap between the prices today and even the projected prices and what CCS projects would cost on a per ton basis. Um, as I said before, buyers have a, um, a, a clear preference for projects uh, with social and environmental co-benefits. Um, and this is, I think, a more obvious case for community-based projects, uh, for uh, forest conservation, reforestation, and is less obvious for, for CCUS projects. Another important issue is that many voluntary um, uh, market buyers, uh, they have a hesitation to financially support oil and gas or heavy industry 
mainly due to public acceptance or criticism by NGOs. So if, for example, you would do a CCS project in um, a new oil and gas exploration site, then I think there would be a lot of criticism by NGOs that would say, the IPCC tells us we cannot do new exploration. All the, the reserves that exist today have to stay in the ground. So if um, the voluntary market would financially support CCS projects, which are a good thing, um, but in the context of new oil and gas field, that would be problematic. And many buyers in the, in, in the voluntary market uh, have also, they don't want to be connected to oil and gas industry because um, yeah, the oil and gas industry has a, a very negative uh, connotation among, uh, among the NGOs and, and the more greener uh, parts of society. So um, it's, it, it, it's difficult to convince buyers to support projects in, in these sectors that have to uh, transform uh, uh, over, uh, to achieve net zero. Um, or, or, or that, you know, that, that are not supposed to, to, to um, survive uh, in, in, in a net zero uh, world. Um, so, so in my opinion, it's, it is more likely that these uh, CCS and these more traditional sectors will be covered by compliance instruments and, and markets. As a counter argument to that, uh, one could argue that um, even the science-based targets initiative is now um, arguing that companies should do as much as they can within their own value chain and sector. So if the oil and gas industry, for example, would start to buy voluntary offsets from CCS projects within their own value chain, that could, be, um, that could change um, the game and could create demand within the, the oil and gas sector itself. So we would take money from the oil and gas industry and invest in, in, in CCS uh, projects. But that's, um, yeah, whether that would work in practice or not um, is I think rather, I think a big question mark. Then um, just to finish on this hypothesis, um, there is I think um, a however here. Um, we believe that voluntary markets might be able to support some early uh, pre-compliance projects or transactions in the market, as pointed out by Christian. And I think voluntary markets will also make a significant contribution towards the development and evolution of regulatory frameworks uh, for uh, compliance schemes. Um, so one example that we have in mind here since we're in Japan is it would be once the, the, the CCS initiative has the, uh, the, the, the methodology under VERA and the verified carbon standard, it is in the public domain. And then it would be very interesting to see how that framework could be adapted to schemes like the JCM or the J credit scheme uh, in Japan. And I think with a few tweaks, um, these um, upcoming government driven schemes uh, can leverage, I think, a lot of knowledge and investments that were done around building these frameworks in the voluntary market. Then my second hypothesis is that voluntary markets will play an important role for uh, CDR projects, for removal projects, including direct air capture, BACs, CO2 mineralization and enhanced weathering. Reason here being that there is that the net zero strategies, as pointed out by SPTI, uh, have a, they trigger an explicit demand for carbon removals, uh, which goes, I think, beyond uh, compliance markets. And the supply of nature-based removals, like reforestation or soil carbon projects, won't be sufficient to cover the required levels of removals as per IPCC. Um, one trend that we see in the market as well is that nature-based removals like reforestation are perceived as more risky due to non-permanence risk, so the risk of a, a, a forest catching fire. Uh, and last but not least, the, the supply and demand dynamics for carbon removals in the market will sustain prices uh, on, a, on a higher level. Um, and then I think that there is like my last slide, um, and this is the third hypothesis. And this uh, and the hypothesis here is that compliance markets will be key to scale both CCOS and CDR industries. 
So compliance markets, including, and that's important, it's not only baseline and crediting schemes, including emission trading schemes, carbon taxes, public subsidies and tax incentives, like the 45Q scheme in the US, um, can reach the right level of ambition in terms of market size, prices, and specific technical, regulatory, and financial support to scale CCOS and CDR industries as required by science. Um, there are some overarching issues with international frameworks like the Paris Agreement that still needs to sort out how we account for removals or the London Protocol, for example, uh, which still needs to uh, sort out how to treat a CO2 storage and cross-border CO2 transport. Uh, so there are a few things that still have to be further developed. Um, and the same applies to lo more local policy and regulatory issues, such as regulations for the construction and operation of CO2 pipelines or CO2 storage sites, for example. So I think there is a, still some way to go until these markets can uh, um, scale. But as we know from the case in Japan, there are significant efforts already being made. Um, yeah, and as I said before, I believe that compliance schemes will benefit from these early deployment experiences within voluntary markets. And I think most importantly, we see already today some interesting precedents in terms of uh, compliance schemes or subsidies that are being uh, implemented by by the public sector, mainly in the US and Europe. Uh, worth mentioning here are the 45Q scheme in the US, the low carbon fuel standard in, in California, for example, uh, the European, the, the UETS, which is now expanding to include also CCS activities. And the prices are also reaching a, a level of between 80 to 100 uh, euro per ton of CO2, which makes CCS projects uh, viable. And there is also the EU Innovation Fund, which is uh, supporting early stage um, development of, um, uh, of CCUS projects. And I'll stop here, here are the contact details in case of any follow-up questions that we can't cover uh, in the call today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick, for sharing your opinion and prospects. Um, if I may comment, um, your hypothesis makes sense to me. Yeah, when it comes to carbon credits generated by shares, we should carefully consider um, macro business environment, including time frame for technology deployment, market condition, and many, many other things. So, um, and we should have a broad perspective always. Great. Um, I have received several questions for you. Okay, um, this is from Nanako. Um, I would like to know if there are any trends among carbon credit buyers in ASEAN, especially with respect to CCS and CDRs. For example, willingness to purchase at the premium price for a long-term containment perspective. Yeah, very good. Um, so I think most of the demand for, um, I would say, technological removals, uh, or I have to say, I think what we see, it uh, was, was pointed out by, by ACR as well, there is still limited demand in the voluntary market for classic CCS uh, projects. There were maybe some transactions in the US, but we see a lot of interest for uh, CDR uh, or technological removals. Uh, South Pole has launched uh, last year the next gen uh, carbon removal purchase facility together with Mitsubishi Corporation, which aggregates demand from buyers to buy CDR credits at an average price of $200 per ton. So that's way above current market levels. And that facility targets specifically carbon removal projects. Within that facility, we have at the moment um, the five anchor buyers. Uh, with significant commitments uh, on aggregate. Uh, we are talking about $50 million in commitments as of today from five buyers. 
And among these buyers, there is one Japanese company, which is uh, Mitsui OSK Lines. So I would say this is the first uh, courageous buyer uh, in uh, Japan or in Asia, I think as a whole, uh, that is committing to buy technological removals at this very high price of $200 uh, per ton. Other than that, we see that in Asia, companies tend to be more price sensitive or that many are not even offsetting yet. So this is, um, I think, a more mature market in Europe and in the US. So most of the willingness to pay at the moment we're seeing from uh, European and US companies. But we hope that the example by Mitsui OSK lines will uh, be replicated also in the region. Yeah, I see um, CDR is now popular anywhere in the world. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, this is uh, from Masumi, uh, who moderated yesterday's session. Um, with the swing back to energy security due to the Ukraine crisis, we believe that the value of CCS credits for reduction from the oil and gas se sector should also be reviewed. Do you have any thoughts on initiatives to improve the reputation of reduction credits? That's a good question for me, too. Yeah. So. I do think that um, yeah, if we think of the case of Japan, for example, that is still reliant on, on coal and, and natural gas to some extent, and that has also limited uh, potential uh, because of limited area, surface area for renewables. Um, I think, and, 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 and this I think, I think applies also to many countries in ASEAN where there is still a, a heavy reliance on, 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 on fossil fuel based power generation. I think in these countries, the role of CCS uh, could be very important. And because maybe companies in this region would understand uh, th that narrative better than maybe in Europe or in the US, where the, the focus is more on 100% transition towards renewables, um, there might be, I think, uh, maybe more interest or um, uh, um, more demand from buyers based in Asia uh, for this type of, of credits. I think that will dep depend also a little bit by signals from governments and what governments will encourage uh, companies to do. Um, so I think um, so. I think there is hope uh, for carbon credits to support CCS uh, projects that reduce emissions, not only the removals, um, but I think that, that will need uh, probably some, some government support as well, and uh, will be probably, um, I think, the, the, the likely to fly uh, within the context of domestic markets, for example, uh, which can be are easier to regulate by by governments, and they can uh, control more the demand and supply and the types of projects that are eligible. Uh, because in the voluntary markets, there will be always competition to, to projects that are cheaper, like the nature-based solutions, forest conservation, agriculture, will probably always come at, um, at a cheaper price than CCS. So it will be difficult for CCS projects to compete um, in voluntary markets unless they drop uh, with the prices significantly. Thanks a lot for your insight. Um, thank you very much, Patrick, and thank you for being so uh, flexible. You saved us. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you. <laughs>